Okay, well, we are going to be back in the, the letter of James. I just didn't really have any uh, liberty or peace to go anywhere else, so uh, we're going to be in, in the book of James. And um, just by, if you, you can turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. <clears throat> And just by way of a brief um, little introduction or a review, just the last uh, two weeks, if you weren't here, we've been looking at the end of James chapter 3, those last five verses, and then uh, we're going to be looking at the first three verses of chapter 4 this morning. Um, and so let me read, I'll start in uh, verse 13 of James chapter 3, and I'll, I'll read down through verse <clears throat> 4 of chapter 4. So this is what uh, James says. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish, selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I'll I'll stop right there. Um, So what we've been doing the last uh, two weeks, we've been looking at this this portion of uh, James, and uh, James is really... He's addressing the, the issue of, of wisdom. And so he made a contrast um, between what true wisdom is like and what the characteristics, the quality of true wisdom is like versus uh, a false wisdom. And so he, he laid that out for us, and that's what we, we've looked at the last two weeks. Um, and so, but in chapter 4, in these first three verses, um, just to remind you, I, I said that really these, these three verses, the first three verses of chapter 4 really... Uh, they connect to what he's been saying at the end of chapter 3. And so in a lot of ways, um, you know, these, these divisions, the chapter headings and the verses are obviously put in, you know, later. Um, but, but there is a, a lot of correlation, a connection between these first three verses of chapter 4 and the end of chapter 3. Um, and now at, at first glance, you wouldn't, you know, it, 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 he, he asked a question there at, the, at the, the beginning of chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? And so it looks like, you know, maybe he's, this is a new, a new topic, a new subject, right? Because he did that at the, at, in verse 13 of chapter 3. He asked a question, who is wise and understanding among you? Um, and so, it, you know, it might appear that, well, this is a new, you know, he's starting a new topic, right? Now he's going to be talking about quarrels and fights and, and you know, and, and what, what the cause of this is. But really, it's, it's really linked closely to this whole subject of, of wisdom because, you know, what he was making the point is, is that wisdom, true wisdom, that comes from God, it's not, it's not an issue, it's not a matter of, uh, necess- of theological knowledge. That's not, that's not what he says. He says true wisdom is defined or it's marked by, by someone's conduct, by your behavior. And so he gives all these, these characteristics there in verse 17 of chapter 3 of what wisdom, true wisdom is like. It's pure, it's peaceable, it's uh, reasonable, it's, it's full of good works and mercy, these, these various traits. And the result of wisdom, he says, is peace. That's what true wisdom produces. It produces peace uh, in, in an individual's life, and it produces peace in the assembly. Okay, And so that's why he's making this contrast between uh, that and then a false wisdom, an earthly wisdom that, that's... that's uh, earthly, it's, it's sensual, it's even demonic, and he says it's characterized by envy 
and selfish ambition. And so, and that is the result of that type of wisdom is, is disorder and strife, all right? And so really what he's picking up now in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, he's, he's talking about the fact that there is a lot of disorder and strife in their assembly. And so, so he's, he's really saying that, um, that therefore the, the, the type of wisdom that some of these men are professing to have um, they've, got, they've, got, they've got the wrong kind. They, they have this wisdom that, that actually is very earthly and sensual and demonic. And so, so, so it's, it's really related to this whole subject um, of, of what true wisdom is like. Um, so, so he's really making kind of a shift here in his focus in chapter 4, uh, just kind of a shift not to a new topic but to a discussion of the same topic um, from a different angle. Um, Okay, so, so let's see what he addresses here in chapter 4. So in the first two verses, um, he is talking about... Uh, well, let, me read, let me read those first two verses again. He says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. All right, so the, the problem that he's addressing there among these, these believers is that there is, uh, apparently there's, there's, there's fighting, quarreling, coveting, and he even uses the word there in verse 2, murder, okay? And so, so what exactly is going on here? What, what, are, what are these conflicts that, that are uh, present in, in the assembly? Um, and it's... Those words, that, that's tra- the word that's translated quarrel and the word that's translated fight and the word that's translated murder, all can be used and typically are used in, in, a, in a literal sense. In other words, to refer to, to physical violence or physical fighting. And so there are some people, some actually, you know, more than one, you know, commentators and scholars that, that, that believe that that's actually what was going on, that there was, there was some, some form of uh, uh, physical violence that was occurring there among these believers. Now, that, you know, seems a little unlikely, um, but let me give you some, you know, some of the reasons why, why somebody would propose that. Um, again, they, these words, um, they're, they're, they typically have a meaning of, of, of referring to actual physical uh, physical violence and, and, and uh, conflict, um, and also at the time that James was writing, uh, you may recall there was a movement uh, called the, the Zealots, there was a group of uh, J- Jewish, um, Jewish adherents who were called Zealots, and what they did was they were very zealous for the law, for the, Mose- for the Mosaic law, um, and so they even advocated and promoted violence as a means of accomplishing their goals. So they would advocate, they would assassinate, you know, Roman leaders and, and other, other influential people to try to accomplish, uh, you know, their goals of, of protecting Judaism or, or promoting uh, the Mosaic Law. Um, and so, it, it, so it's possible that, you know, James is writing to Jewish believers. So it's possible that some of these believers actually may have come out of this movement. They may, they may have been zealots. Um, and, and in fact, you remember even Jesus had a disciple. You remember one of his disciples? Who's, who's, who's Simon the Zealot. Simon Zeloti. Simon the Zealot, okay? So it's possible that even Simon, you know, may have come out of this, 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 uh, this movement as well. And so, so based on these facts... Some people pr- propose that, that really that, that's what he's talking about, that there was some form of physical violence um, in, these, in these conflicts uh, among the, the believers that he's writing to. But certainly it just seems unlikely that that's the case, right? I mean, if, if um, you know, he is writing to these are, these are believers, um, and if these people have uh, been truly been converted, it's just it's unlikely that this type of, this type of severe physical you know, violence to the point of murder is actually happening. And, and if it was, it certainly is, seems very um, strange that James then would just kind of pass over it. I mean, you know, he just kind of makes this you know, a passing remark about murder, right? So, so it's, 
it's unlikely that that's actually what was happening. Okay, so, but what was probably going on? What was the, what was the, the conflict and the strife and the, and the quarrels that were occurring? Well, th- that, that word, one of those words for quarrels, uh, actually, typically it does mean verbal conflict or verbal quarrels. And let me just give you a couple of references um, elsewhere in the New Testament where we see that. Um, um, and just be, before we do that, I was thinking, you know, I mean, if this was in our assembly today, you know, and, uh, you know, what would this look like if, if in fact, there was this, you know, f- violence taking place? You know, well, I mean, we, you know, would we have guys out in the parking lot after the service, a couple of guys, you know, duking it out over some theological issue, uh, you know, and then nothing much being said about that? No, no, that wouldn't happen, right? Killing each other. Killing each other. Yeah, yeah, that, that, would not be, that would not be occurring in the assembly. Certainly, Pastor Tim would be on, on top of that, right? Okay, so, so it's just, you know, it's, it's unlikely that that's actually what was going on. So, so more likely, um, there were, these were verbal confrontations, verbal conflicts and arguments and fights. Um, for example, in 2 Timothy 2, 23 and 24, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says this, he says, "...have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels." And the Lord's servant must, be, must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Okay, that's our word quarrels, right? So it's clearly in the, in the context of, of, of a verbal, some kind of a verbal confrontation, right? Uh, Paul says the same thing he writes to Titus in chapter 3, verse 9 of Titus. He says, um, he says but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. All right, and so, so, so clearly, that's that's really what he must have in mind. These are the, these are the types of conflicts and quarrels that are going on among these these believers. Uh, now, also that word that's translated fight, although it does normally refer to some kind of physical confrontation. Um, it can have a, a more of a, a metaphorical meaning. In fact, it means the the word is. Polemos, which might sound familiar, we get our English word polemics or polemics, which means, which is the, the art or practice of disputing or arguing, okay? Some people are masters of polemics. They're, they're good at arguing, okay? So, so that's clearly, so that word fights can have that, that meaning also. All right, so, and, and, you know, we do the same thing in, in English, right? If somebody says that they're um, you know, we might say um, uh, there's a battle brewing in Congress over the, the budget deficit, all right? Well, you know, we don't mean that there's actually going to be, uh, you know, fisticuffs between, you know, at least not in our country. I mean, in some, some countries that actually that, that happens, right? But, but, but clearly we mean that there's just going to be, there's going to be arguing, debating, and may get heated, but, but we don't mean that somebody's actually going come to come to blows. So... Um, and especially in light of the fact that if, if this kind of stuff was going on, just very, um, you know, acrimonious uh, speech and, and um, you know, arguing and, and fighting, if this was going on, typically when that happens, there's going to, that's, as, as a, what follows that or what's, what's part of that is going to be harsh words, right? There's going to be some criticism, there's probably going to be some slander, uh, maybe some gossip, um, and these are all sins of the tongue, right, that James, he addressed very sharply at the beginning of chapter 3, all right? And so the context, uh, you know, it's probably likely then that that's, this is what was going on there in, at, uh, to th- these believers that he's writing to. All right, now, so this, ki- this type of quarreling, this type of uh, verbal fighting that James is condemning um, certainly wasn't unique just to his day or, or even to the people that he's, that he's writing to, right? Um, I mean, this kind of stuff, sadly, it, it goes on today, right? Uh, but listen to, um, this is an interesting quote by a man. Uh, his name was Baruch Spinoza. He was a, a Jewish philosopher. He was Dutch, and he lived in the 17th century, Okay. And so, so he's an observer. He's not, he's not a Christian. He's a Jewish man, but he's a philosopher. And so this is what he observed. He said, I have often wondered that persons who make boast of professing the Christian religion, uh, 
namely love, joy, peace, temperance, and charity to all men, should quarrel with such rancorous animosity and display daily towards one another such bitter hatred that this, that this, rather than the virtues which they profess, is the readiest criteria of their faith. See what he's saying? He's saying that, you know, that, that, he, that in his observation, there's, there's a lot of fighting and rancorous and, and animosity and hatred among Christians that, that is, is more telling about, it says a lot about the, 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 the reality of, of, the, of their faith, of what they're professing, right? You know, it reminds me of what James said earlier on here in, in, in chapter um, 1, verse 22. He said, he said, that one of the tests of true faith is to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. All right. So, um, so certainly this kind of thing goes on, and it goes on today. You know, just last week Matt was preaching on uh, love, right? The importance of love in the Christian life, uh, how how absolutely you know essential it is, and, and he he made the point that apparently there are some uh, these some of these new Calvinists who make it a practice on Facebook to uh, regularly uh, ridicule Arminian believers for their deficient theology, right? Um, and that's really, that's a terrible testimony to those outside the, the church who are, who are observing that. Um, and it's a real manifestation of a lack of love, and it really is an example of the type of quarreling and fighting spirit that James is rebuking. All right, now, however, you know, of course... Some battles need to be fought, right? Um, I mean, just because, you know, one of the marks of wisdom here that we talked about is, is, is meekness and, and gentleness and peace, but certainly there are times when, when you know, Christians, we, we need, to, we need to, to fight, right? We need, need to take a stand for, for the truth. And so certainly if, if the, the purity of the gospel is at stake, um, the authority of the Bible uh, we need to battle for that. Um, we need to battle for the unborn and right and against the evil of abortion. Those are these are things that we need to take a stand on. Um, you know, homosexual marriage. Um, you, you know, I, I just I just read the other day that uh, there's a, you know, we're, we're here in Texas. We're a fairly conservative state, but that, but there's been a bill introduced to try to repeal the the amendment that that forbids uh, same sex marriage. So that that kind of thing is is coming here even in Texas. So. Um, you know, other social ill, social sins, we need, to, we need to take stand. We need to fight for those things, right, against those things, right? But even then, even when we need to battle um, as Christians, we need to do it in a manner that, is, that we don't sacrifice our, our Christian virtues and our, and our principles, right? We need, to, we need to, to engage conflict in such a manner that we, that we represent our faith and we represent Christ well, and so, for example, that verse we just read in 2 Timothy 2, 24, really, um, it teaches, teaches us how we are to correct others. Let me read, I'll read that again to you. 2 Timothy 2, 24. He says, um, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, Correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. All right, and so so even when we when we need to fight, when we need to engage in 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 in, in you know legitimate battles and conflict, we need to do it really in a spirit of of gentleness, right? And, and uh, praying that God would lead others to repentance and to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, and, and gentleness again, that's another characteristic of of true wisdom that we looked at last week that comes from above, that comes from God. All right, so, um, so now we don't know exactly what the disputes that James is talking about were, right? Because he doesn't, he doesn't comment directly on the issues involved. He doesn't say what exactly they were fighting about, what, what, what the conflict was about. Um, and the fact that he doesn't even, he doesn't even mention that probably tells us or reveals that, that he's more concerned with, with the attitude, the spirit, and the contentiousness that was going on than with, you know, who was in the right and who was in the wrong, right? Um, and most of the time, that's usually the case, right? I mean, frequently when there are conflicts between Christians, 
I mean, it's pretty rare that, that you know, one party is completely right and the other party is completely wrong. I mean, usually there's some measure of error or fault on both sides. And so what James is condemning here is this, just this, this attitude, this contentious, uh, you know, fighting spirit. Um, all right, so that's the, uh, that's the, the trouble, the, the, the conflict that's going on there. It's, this, it's verbal uh, arguments and fights, and, and it's rancorous, um, and, it's, uh, and it's causing turmoil, and it certainly is not producing peace in the assembly. So, now what is the, what is the, the source of these quarrels and fights? What is, what's the root? What's really causing these, these quarrels and these fights? Well, he tells us, he tells us there in verse 1, chapter 4, he says, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? All right, so he tells us very clearly. He says the source of these quarrels and these fights is, is the passions that were at war within, uh, and actually that, that could be translated within your members. Um, now that word passions, it just means, in fact you might even have a footnote in your, in your Bible, it just means pleasures. That's what it means, okay? So it's, it's uh, that's literally what it means, pleasures. But it, but it often has the idea when it's used um, of, of, of sinful or self-indulgent pleasures. Uh, the word that's used there, it's, it's um, hedone, and from that we get our English word hedonist, a hedonist, hedonist right? And this is the, the, the dictionary defines a hedonist as uh, a person whose life is devoted to the pursuit of pleasure and self-gratification. Okay? So, so someone who is pursuing his own pleasure and own self-gratification is, is a hedonist. And that's, that's the word that he uses here. Um, and, and it's used five times in the New Testament, this word. It always has this uh, negative connotation. Let me just give you a couple of these other references. Um, for example, in the parable of the, the sower... For the parable of the seeds in Luke 8, 14, remember that? Jesus talks about the, uh, the different types of soil, and he talks about the seed that fell among the thorns, right? And this is what he says. And then when he's explaining the parable, he says, And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. All right? So the, the pleasures that he's referring to there are, are those um, pleasures of this world that come in and choke out the seed of God's word. And, right, and, th- and this we see happen, sadly, this is a fairly, fairly regular occurrence, right? Um, someone, someone they, they profess faith in Christ and they're, they're baptized, um, they're added to the church, they join the church, they appear to be following Christ very, very zealously. Um, and then something happens, right? And some, some pleasure, some earthly pleasure, maybe it's uh, you know, illicit sex or illicit drugs or some other sensual pleasure overtakes them, right? And, and it chokes out the word and, and they're back in the world. And, and you know, and we've seen this here in, in, in our church. And I, I was thinking about a, even a, just recently a, a friend of ours in Florida that um, we, we actually saw when we were back there a couple of months ago. But this guy was... He was a, um, a very, uh, a, had a good grasp of theology. He was a dentist, so he was a, a bright guy, and he was a very faithful uh, member of the church. And, and, um, but, he had a, but in his past, he had had a drug addiction problem before he was converted. Um, and that, that, that crept back into his life, and, and it caused, um, he ended up being disciplined by the church. He was, he was disciplined by the, uh, the dental board, so he almost lost his license. Um, he had to go to a rehab facility for about six months, he, he, involving a lot of manual labor. His wife almost left him, a lot of turmoil in the family. Um, and so as a result of, of the pleasures of, of this life, and now hopefully it appears that he has truly repented and, and um, he's back on track. But, but a great deal of damage was done to him and to his family through the pursuit of, of pleasures, earthly, sensual pleasure. Um, another passage where we see this word 
pleasure is in Titus 3, verse 3. And so we're talking about this is what James is saying is what causes the quarrels and the fights that are, that are occurring. He says it's these pleasures, passions that are at war within you. So in Titus 3, verse 3, Paul writes, and he says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. All right, and so here we, we see a, a connection. Paul says that at one time that he was a slave to various passions and pleasures, and we see a connection between that and, and envy. He says, passing our days in malice and envy. And so, and that's the same kind of a connection that James is making. He's saying that, that the self-indulging passions of the people that the, the believers that he's writing to is causing them to covet and to envy one another. He talks about that in verses 1 and 2, which is leading to these quarrels and fights uh, that they are experiencing. All right? And so there's a direct correlation between uh, jealousy and, and selfish ambition uh, with these sinful desires. Um, now, just as kind of an, as an aside, if, if you've read um, John Piper's book, um, Desiring God, it's a, it's a great book, um, but the, you might recall that the subtitle to the book is Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. And uh, I remember that um, when we studied that book in our uh, Sunday school class in Florida several, several years ago, uh, and I remember our, uh, the, the, our pastor there made the comment that he wished Piper had used a different word than hedonist in the title. Um, and Piper must have anticipated that kind of a response because he has a whole, there's a whole appendix in the book as to why he used that phrase, Christian hedonism. Um, and so and he makes the point, Piper makes the point that he's, um, he's using it to mean that, that the greatest pleasure we can experience is in, is in knowing God, right? Is in desiring God, right? Um, and he talks about how we're even command, there are commands given. You know, Psalm 37, verse 4, uh, we are commanded to delight yourself in the Lord. Um, and he says the, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Okay, so, and so, and he also says that he uses the term because he knows he's going to get a reaction, okay, and so, and he's trying to kind of provoke people to think about this whole idea of, of uh, pursuing our greatest delight, our greatest pleasure in God. So that's just by way of an, uh, of an, uh, of an aside. However, despite the fact that that's the way he uses the word hedonism in that positive sense, um, every time it's used in, in the New Testament, uh, it does have this negative meaning, this negative connotation. All right, so, um, so James says that these, these passions and pleasures is what are causing the fights and the quarrels that are, that are, that are stirring up the assembly. And he says, he says even specifically that it's these, these passions, these pleasures are at war within you or at war within your members. Um, and so he uses more of this kind of this terminology of, you know, battle and fighting. And now he's saying that these, these passions are at war within you. Um, and the members that he's talking about could refer either to the individual believers who were part of the assembly, right? And so that there's the, there are these passions at war, you know, among the various believers there. Or it could mean the members referring to the members of, of our body right, the parts of our body, uh, and, and, and frequently that word is used to, dis- to mean that, and so that's probably what he has in mind, is that these, these passions, these desires, they're at war within individual believers in, in, our, in our body parts, okay, as part of some of our bodily passions, um, and it, it probably means that also because there's a parallel passage in First Peter, and actually there are a lot of similarities between James and, and First Peter, but in First Peter 2.11, Peter says this, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. All right? And so, so that's, our, that's our, our word here, passions, uh, which wage war against your individual soul. So, so that's probably what he has in mind. So what he's saying is that the source, 
or the cause of the division and the conflict and the quarrels and the strife that, that exists is the, the sinful passions within individual members, individual believers that are they're not being restrained and they're spilling over into envy and jealousy and selfish ambition within the assembly. All right, And this is what James said back in chapter 3. He said this is the evidence of a false and a sensual and a demonic wisdom. He said that type of a wisdom is going to produce envy and selfish ambition that results in disorder or confusion and every evil practice. All right, so that's the, the source, the cause of these quarrels and fights um, that, that, are, that is existing there among these believers. So, um, but that still raises the question, well, how intense was this strife and this conflict? All right, because he does say there in verse 2, he says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. And so we still have this issue of this, the word murder, because every time that word is used in the, in the New Testament, and it's used frequently, it always refers to literal murder. Whenever, whenever somebody quotes the, one of the, the commandment, thou shalt not murder, that's the word that's used, and it's referred a couple times to, to actual murders. So, so what does he mean? What, you know, how, how severe is this, is this conflict? Um, and, you know, again, as I said, some of, these, some of these commentators talk about the zealot background and some of his, you know, so they actually believe that this, you know, some of his hearers were, were engaging in murder. Um, but, again, I, I think that's just, that's just hard to, to really imagine. Um, so, so what, what does it mean? How do we, you know, how do we explain that? Um, well, some people have thought that what happened, and, and apparently uh, Martin Luther believed this, is that there was a, uh, an early scribe may have made a, a mistake in, in transcribing, because the word that's translated, you murder, it's very similar to the, the word that, that means you are envious. It's just they're like two letters that are different in the Greek, okay? And so, so he, he thought, he, he and others thought that perhaps what happened was, well, somebody somewhere along the line, somebody just, um, somebody mis, um, trans, or, or made a mistake in, in, in recording the text. Well, that's, um, I mean, I guess that's certainly, I guess that's possible, but that should always be a, you know, a last resort in, in, in trying to interpret the Bible, right? And it certainly doesn't set a good precedent to believe this. Uh, I mean, if we believe that all Scripture, this is 2 Timothy 3.16, I meant to quote this actually when we started, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All right, so if we can believe that all Scripture is, is inspired by God, is 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 breathed out by God, it's given for our instruction, it's given for our edification. Um, I, I think certainly we can believe that God uh, has the, the, the power and the ability to preserve that word for us. Um, and it just, it just, it really doesn't set a, a good precedent at all. I mean, if you, if we want to believe that somehow there was, a, there's, a, there's a little mistake here that, that helps us to better, you know, understand the text, well, I mean, what's to say there aren't other, you know, other little mistakes elsewhere, right? And so I think that's just a very dangerous uh, road to, to take or to travel. So uh, I don't think that's, that's not a good way to, to resolve this. Um, but so, well, so what do we do with you murder? Well, another way maybe to understand this would be to say, you know, he, he's meaning this in the way, you know, in the same way that, you know, Jesus talked about... Um, Anger, right? Having an unrighteous anger in, in uh, Matthew five twenty one through twenty three, there in the Sermon on the Mount, and so this, Jesus says, "There, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment, and whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire." All right, so, so maybe it means, maybe he's using this in the sense just to mean, you know, kind of, uh, you know, murderously angry, all right? So that's, that's possible. In fact, one commentator says this expression, you murder, is probably to, to be taken in the sense of having a murderous disposition uh, 
or fostering a brutal and murderous spirit. Okay, so that that could be what what he's what he's getting at. Um, but but probably maybe the best way to understand it though is just is to 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 take it in its literal sense, but to realize that this is. James is saying this is something that is, you know, hypothetically possible, not something that is, is, is occurring or has occurred, but, but that he's warning them that if they're, they're these envious desires, if they don't get, a control, get control over them, that potentially they could lead to something as, as severe as this. Um, and so I, I think maybe that's the way that uh, we should, we should uh, try to under, understand that. All right, so... so James gives us then, he gives us a really, a very uh, insightful analysis of human conflict, right? Uh, he says basically that, that verbal arguments, okay, among individuals or within churches, um, individual violence, and even, you know, national conflict. I mean, why do, why do, you know, nations go to war against other nations? Well, ultimately, it can be traced to what he says is this, these wrongful lusts, these wrongful desires, sinful desires to have, to want more than what we have, right? And to be envious of and to covet that which others have, whether it's, whether it's their possessions or their position or their status. And so, so he's, he's, he's warning them and he's warning us that these, these, this is the natural end or the result of, of envious desires that are that are fed by our uh, sinful passions if they if they aren't controlled they can ultimately could lead to to some kind of a some kind of a physical armed uh, actual uh, violence <clears throat> all right so that's um that's what he has to say about these these fights and quarrels uh what they are what's causing them um and then at the end of uh, verse two in the beginning of verse 3, and really, you know, they should have been together in one verse there, but he's, now he's going, to talk about, he's going to talk about a little bit about prayer. And he says, at the end of verse 2, he says, You do not have because you do not ask. All right, and then in verse, the beginning of verse 3, he says, you, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Um, and so... Now, he doesn't say exactly what it is that they, that they don't have, that they want. He says that you, you, you don't ask, you don't have because you don't ask, all right? Now, so he doesn't say, so what is it that they don't have, and they don't have it because they, they're not asking God for it? Well, what is that? Well, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't specifically say, um, but, but based on the context here and the context earlier in chapter 3, we can maybe surmise or we can guess that what it was that they wanted was, was uh, wisdom. They wanted wisdom to be recognized as some kind of uh, leaders in their assembly, in, their, in, their, in the, the, the fellowship of, of, of believers that they, that they were a part of. And, and how do we see that? Well, remember, he's already warned back in chapter 3, verse 1, He's, he's kind of rebuked them. He's warned them for, for wanting to become teachers. So apparently they, they, many of them had, had a desire to want to become a teacher. So he warns them about that. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. Um, then in verse 13 of chapter 3, he says, he says, who is wise and understanding among you? Okay, and so apparently some, several of them, some of them thought that they were wise and understanding. And so now he, that he has to kind of correct them as to their, their understanding of what it is to be wise, right? Um, and so, uh, so apparently maybe that's what it is that, that, they, that they want. They want the wisdom that they think will enable them to, to be qualified to be some kind of a, some kind of a church leader. Um, and it also reminds us, you know, of what James said earlier in chapter 1, he said in chapter 1, verse 5, if, if any of you lacks wisdom, what, what should we do? If you don't have wisdom and, and you want wisdom, ask God, right? Ask God for wisdom. And God, who is generous, who gives generously without reproach, w- will give it, okay? So, um, so it's, it's likely then that that's what it was, that they were, they were wanting to have wisdom, but, but James says uh, the reason you don't have it is because you don't you you, you don't ask. You haven't asked God. And, and remember, we talked about how wisdom wisdom comes from God. It's a gift from God. It comes down from above. True wisdom. Um, 
Okay, but then he says, so he says, you don't have this. You don't have what you want because you don't ask. All right, then he says, oh, in verse 3, though, so apparently he says, but you, you do ask, but you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so apparently they, they, they were asking, they, they, they were praying at least, at least some of the time, but he says the reason, again, that you don't have this wisdom that you need is because you're asking with wrong motives, all right? And so he says, uh, you're asking, the reason why you don't have it, you ask, you don't receive it, is because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And that's the same word, passions, on your pleasures, okay, on your sinful Passion, sinful desires, sinful pleasures. Um, and that word that's interesting, he says, the reason you don't, you don't have it is because you, you're asking wrongly because you're going to spend it on your passions. That's the same word that's used. It means to squander or to waste or to consume. It's the same word that's used in, in uh, Luke 15, verse 14, where the, remember the prodigal son, he's said to have, to have spent all of his father's inheritance right, on his sinful indulgence. Uh, I'll, I'll, let me just read that to you. And when he had spent everything, the prodigal son, right? He had, he had wasted. He had you know, indulged all, everything that he had gotten his inheritance on his, his sinful lifestyle. Uh, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. All right, well, that's the same word. That that's, they, they, the, they were desiring wisdom for the purpose of spending it, um, squandering it upon their own sinful desires. Now, now. You know, Jesus did, does talk a lot about prayer, right? And he gives us a lot of, a lot of promises about prayer. Um, for example, in uh, Matthew 7, verse 7, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. All right, so these are, these are some promises some, some given to us that to, to seek, to ask, to to pursue, right? To pray, to come to God, and, and, and to believe that he'll, he'll give us the things that we ask for, right? But clearly, Jesus had in mind asking things of God that have as their focus and their motive God's glory, right? Or his, his name and his will, not an asking that has as its purpose uh, indulging sinful passions that, uh, that, as Peter says, you know, war against our souls, um, in fact, we're taught to pray, one of the, one of the you know, clearest passages in the New Testament where we're, we're taught how we ought to pray, right? In the, in the, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, or, or maybe it's better called the Disciples' Prayer, right? Jesus teaches the disciples how they should pray. In Matthew um, 6, verses 9 through 13, uh, we're told, we're taught, he's, he says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. All right, or that could also be translated, let your name be kept holy. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, and then he says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, but he says the first thing we should pray when we pray is we should pray that God's name is hallowed, that God's name is kept holy. All right, that's that he said that, that should be the priority of, that, that we that we pray about. Uh, and then we said we should pray that God's will be done, that his kingdom will come. Um, and uh, John writes also in 1 John 5, verse 14, regarding prayer. He says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him, all right? And so we need to, we need to align our prayers and our, our requesting in accordance with, with God's will and God's purposes, right? Um, so we can't expect God to answer prayers that are motivated by a desire to indulge sinful passions, right? Which is what, what, what these believers were doing. That, and, and James is saying, well, that's why you don't have because you're asking wrongly with wrong motives. Um, and I was thinking about, um, I learned something really simple when I was uh, first converted. I was in college, I was involved with an organization called the Navigators, which did a lot of, we did a lot of uh, scripture memory and discipleship training and evangelism on campus. And, but I learned something, just a real simple little tool, but it was something to kind of help me in ordering my prayers. Uh, 
And some of you have probably heard this. It's, it's just an acronym, and the acronym is ACTS, A-C-T-S. Uh, the A stands for adoration, the C for confession, the T for thanksgiving, and then the S is for supplication. Um, and so that's just a very simple little, but it's been helpful to me, helpful to me to help to remember um, a way in which to, to order my prayers when, when I pray. And, and, you know, we all have a tendency, I think, to want to uh, rush into supplications, right? We want to ask God to, you know, for our, our needs and, and, and even legitimate needs, right? Um, and, and, that's, and that's certainly we, we, we should do that. We can go to God as our Heavenly Father and ask Him for the things that we need. But, but that really is not the pattern, certainly it's not the pattern that we see in the Lord's Prayer, right? I mean, He says we should be praying first that God's name is hallowed and honored, that His kingdom will come and His will be done before we petition Him for our needs, for our daily bread, right? Um, and also, I think we should be praying more for the needs of others before praying for ourselves. Um, you know, and, and the verse that we looked at last week from Philippians 2, 3 and 4 tells us, Paul says, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so I was thinking, you know, if we really are counting others more than more significant than ourselves, well, we'll be praying more for others than we will be for ourselves, right? Um, and I remember one time I was a young Christian, and um, I was going through a real, um, real uh, struggle, some real spiritual battles, and so um, and I was praying, and it just seemed like God wasn't answering my prayers, and I was, it was uh, really weighing me down. So I went to a friend who was kind of a spiritual mentor to me, and he, he listened very patiently, and, and he, he prayed with me, and I think maybe he asked me a little bit about my prayer life, and, and then his advice to me was, uh, was, maybe you need to spend more time praying for the needs of others, and, um, and I think that, that was good advice. That was something that I, I needed to learn, I needed to hear. So, um, so we, can, we can learn some things about how we ought to, how we ought to pray. And certainly these, so these, these believers that James is writing to um, are, are asking with wrong motives and therefore they're not receiving. They're not receiving the wisdom that they, that they need. All right, so now let's look at um, verse 4. And so James really, he, um, he kind of shifts gears here. And really this would probably should be a, the, the beginning of a new section, verse 4. So this should probably should be a new paragraph. Um, and he starts with something very, he makes a very harsh statement. He says, you adulterous people. Um, and so this next section, about verse 4 through about verse 10, is really one of the str- most strongly worded calls to repent anywhere in the New Testament. Um, and, and so so we're not going to look at that whole section, but we'll just look at verse 4 and see what, uh, see what he has to say. Um, and, and the reason I say that, if, if, this was, if, if verse 4 is just really you know, connected to verses 1 through 3, then really he's talking about repentance, but he's talking about it just specifically in reference to this problem of the fighting and the quarreling, right? Because it, it's, it's right here. But if this is a separate section, um, and there's some other reasons why... If, the language that he uses in verses 4 through 10, he uses a lot of um, imagery from the Old Testament. He quotes the Old Testament a couple times. He, 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 he sounds like uh, some of the prophets from the Old Testament. So it really, it's a, it's a sep- it should be a separate section. And so, um, and so what he's saying now, this, this idea of the need to repent, really has to do not only with verses 1 through 3 and that problem, but with some of these other problems that he's been addressing, right? All right, so, so what does he say? He says, and the reason why it's, this is, you know, Frequently in, throughout the book, he, he addresses his hearers, he calls them brothers. He did that he's, six times, he's done it prior to this point. Uh, three times, he's called them beloved brothers, okay? And so now, suddenly, he says, he's not calling them brothers, he's calling them you adulterous people. And so it, uh, it should arrest us and kind of get our attention. Um, now, what does he mean, you adulterous people? Well, that literally means you adulteresses, all right? It's a female. Well, he, he, he's not meaning 
uh, now suddenly he's talking to females in the congregation who are, have been committing the sin of adultery. Okay, he's got something you know, bigger in mind than that. And so in order to understand what he means, we, we've got to look at uh, some of the Old Testament prophetic books. And so let me just give you a couple of references here. Um, but frequently the Old Testament's compared the relationship between God, b- between Jehovah and his people to a marriage relationship, right? That was a pretty uh, common uh, theme in the Old Testament. For example... In uh, Isaiah 54, verses 5 and 6, he says, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. All right, and so when we see this in, in uh, Ezekiel, uh, other places, Jeremiah 3, 20, he says this, same thing. It says, surely, and so the point is, is Israel is, is, is seen, pictured as God's wife. Uh, when they go after false gods, when they go after idolatry, then it, the picture is that they're committing adultery. All right? And so in Jeremiah 3.20, he says, surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel. Um, now, the place where this is probably most prominent in the Old Testament, can anybody think of where, where Israel is, is, is pictured as being, as, as being married? Hosea. Yeah, Hosea, exactly. And there God actually tells Hosea, the prophet, he says, I want you to go, you're going to marry a prostitute. All right, he says, uh, Hosea 1, 2, and 3, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And so that's, that's, a, that's a, a picture of, God, of Israel's unfaithfulness to God, all right? Uh, their their, their uh, spiritual adultery. Um, now, Jesus even recognized this. He recognized this, this kind of a, a covenant relationship, right? He, he said a couple times in the New Testament in Matthew 4, 16, verse 4, he called those who rejected him, he said they were an evil and adulterous generation. All right, in Matthew 16, verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. All right, so, so Jesus recognized this, this uh, picture of, of marriage. Um, and so, so, so what James is saying is that, is that the, um, by using this term adulteresses, he's, he's identifying his hearers, his readers, as those who are unfaithful people of God because, he says, they're seeking friendship with the world, and therefore they're, they're committing spiritual adultery. Um, and just uh, briefly to you know, talk a little bit about friendship. What, you know, what does uh, friendship with the world mean? You know, we, we tend to have a very casual understanding of friendship, right? You know, and uh, you know, if you're on Facebook, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, but I, you know, I know there's some, there's, it's a tool that you can be used, but, but it's you know, very easy I think, I think Matt brought this out in one of his sermons. It's very easy to be, to be friends with people that you may not even know them very well. Maybe they're really acquaintances, right? But you're a friend, okay? Um, and I've got, I, I have a, a guy that I knew in high school like 30 years ago, and he's recently, I've kind of been connected with him, not on Facebook, but there's another um, medium called LinkedIn. It's kind of more of a business version, so it's a little more professional than, than Facebook. So... Um, but this guy, I, I, I haven't seen this guy in 30 years. We, I went to high school with him. Um, I don't even, we weren't even really close friends in high school. But, but he, I found out he lives in Austin, and so I thought, well, maybe, I'll, you know, maybe we'll have some opportunity. I could talk to him, and maybe I, I could you know, you know, share the gospel with him. So we connected, and, but what he did then is you can, you can endorse someone on this site. So in other words, like if you know them or you've done some work with them or you, you, know, you, know, you know their skills or something, you can endorse them. You can click the button. Well, this guy endorsed me, and I have no idea why, you know, I, we haven't had any contact in 30 years, why he would have endorsed me. I mean, I think we were in the band together in high school. You know, maybe he's, maybe that's, you know. So, but that's, but I mean, this is the kind of, you know, superficial, uh, you know, contacts and friends, friendships that we can have, right? All right, well, that's not what James is talking about. In, in, in his day, friendship was a lot deeper than that. And one commentator says it involves sharing all things in a unity, both spiritual and physical. 
Um, and so, so what he's saying is then that, that if you're a friend of the world, you are, you are adjoining yourself to the world. It's, it's, a, it's, a commi- it's, a, it's an association that you're making. It's a deep relationship. And that if you do that, then he says you are, you're committing spiritual adultery. And he says you're making yourself an enemy of God. That's what he says. All right, so how were, how were James's readers becoming friends with the world? I mean, you know, what, do we, what was it that, 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 that he could say that you, you're, you're committing adultery and that you're becoming a friend of the world? Well, um, I mean, there's nothing that says specifically here that they were, you know, consciously forsaking God and deciding to follow the world instead, right? We don't, we don't see that specifically. But I think what he's saying is that, that they're... Their tendency to imitate the world, right, by, dis- by, by how? Well, by back in chapter 2, he talked about by committing partiality, by being partial, right, by, by discriminating against people, um, by their use of their tongue, by, by sinning with their tongue, right, being, being casual with their tongue. And then, then he's talking about jealousy and selfish ambition. And then he's talking about, in verses 1 through 3, their, their sinful passion. So by in all these ways, um, he says that they are becoming like the world. They're becoming friends of the world. And so, so I think what he's doing is he's, he's trying to, to point out that God is a jealous God, right? God desires that his people love him supremely, right? And God, is, God will not tolerate a rival. And so by, by engaging in some of these just, you know, maybe not even well, I mean, if they were engaging in, 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 in murder, obviously that's a, that's a worldly thing. But even some of these other things that weren't necessarily so severe, they were becoming like the world. They were becoming friends of the world. All right. So, so what are some uh, things that we can learn from this? Well, I think some things we can learn is that our, our sinful desires and passions, if they're not subdued and brought under control, will lead to envy, covetousness, quarrels, fights and potentially even physical violence that's that's where they can that's where they can lead to all right so we need to control our 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 passions and our desires Um, we need to ask god for the things that we need right especially for the wisdom which comes from him that is characterized by purity peace gentleness impartiality and sincerity Uh, when we pray we need to ask god for wisdom not with wrong motives not desires to to serve ourselves or please ourselves, but with desires to honor and to glorify God. And, I, and we need to be on guard against a, a form of worldliness that can, that can creep up on us without being aware of it. You know, I was thinking about that example. You hear about the, uh, you know, the frog, frog in, the, in the pan. And I actually, I, you know, and, and so if you, if you just, if you, if you make the, the water real hot, the frog jumps out, Right. But if you just slowly raise the, the temperature, supposedly the frog doesn't, you know, the frog boils to death, okay? And, and I actually, I Googled that, and, they, you know, I don't know if that's completely true, <laughs> but so there was somebody that did some experiments, and so, but, it, but, you know, there is some research to substantiate that, all right? But, but the point is, it's a good illustration. I think what, what can happen is, you know, there are, there are things that, you know, we tend to think of friendship with the world as like, you know, somebody going out and committing adultery, all right, or somebody, you know, forsaking, you know, Christ and just, you know, abandoning himself to the world, right? But I think what James is saying is that there are, there are a lot of more subtle things that he talks about, sins of the tongue, sins of partiality, uh, selfishness, you know, you know ambition, uh, you, know, um, you know, feeding your sinful desires that, that can, uh, that can, lead to this, this charge of being a friend of the world. And so we need to be on guard. We need to, to, to guard ourselves. Um, all right. And then just lastly, if, if, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your, as your Savior, then, then you need to come to him. And, and if you want to have wisdom, if you, if you want this wisdom from above that, that, that produces these qualities uh, that James has talked about, well... He, in 1 Corinthians, we read this, for, for the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so if you want to know God's wisdom, you need to know, you need to know Christ, and you need to come to him and, and cry out to him. And, and Jesus invites, he invites everyone, he says, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke 
upon you. Learn from me, and I, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All right, well, amen. Well, may we uh, learn some lessons from this portion of, of God's Word. So let's pray.